All right. All right, we're gonna start very shortly, uh, as long as people, you know, as soon as people start uh, to join uh, okay. the room, we are going to start in about a minute or so with uh, our extraordinary guest, Lana Gordon, today. Um, but let's give, uh, let's give it another 30 seconds or so, or a full minute, uh, and I'll start with the introduction. It's always an exciting moment when the room is open and people slowly flood into it. And, uh, slowly flood. <laughs> yes. it, it's, it, like it's exciting. A busy day. It's, it, it's an exciting thing, absolutely. Um, all right, uh, so another 30 seconds or so and I'll, and I'll start. Um, oh, well, look at that, 19 people. Thank you for joining, geez. Yes, and, they'll, and they'll, it'll slowly build up. You'll see wow, in, in the next few minutes. Up. All right, so it's 301. I think uh, we should start with today's master class uh, of Miami New Drama's Mastermind. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Miami New Drama is a nonprofit theater uh, located at the heart of Miami Beach and South Beach on Lincoln Road. Um, we are a very unique company because we do two things that I think not every theater company around the country does. First, uh, we really are committed to the idea that we are as diverse, multicultural, and multilingual as the community we live in. And Miami is one of the most diverse uh, communities and cities in America. In fact, we live in what the future of America will look like. America in the next 50 years, will look like what Miami looks like today. So we have the extraordinary vantage point of uh, telling stories that look like the future of America. Uh, and those stories that we tell are primarily world premieres. And so out of, uh, you know, last season, this season, this is before, the roughly 70% of all of our plays are world premiere, including the world premiere musical we currently have in hibernation at the Colony Theater, uh, entitled A Wonderful World, about the life and music of Louis Armstrong. And uh, one of the stars of the show happens to be a ridiculously talented uh, actor named Lana Gordon. Um, Lana has appeared on Broadway uh, as Nala on The Lion King, um, as well as uh, Shenzi on, in, the, in The Lion King as well. Um, also in Broadway's, uh, in, at, at Chicago on Broadway as Velma Kelly. Um, and for those lucky few who were able to see uh, the first seven previews of A Wonderful World before we were uh, forced to hibernate, uh, she played Lil Hardin, um, and she has an extraordinary career that spans through Broadway, uh, Europe, um, and uh, and she really is a top-notch actor. And there's a couple things before I, I, I let her speak that I want to say of her, which is that like she has craft. Like I see, I, I've been through the rehearsals, I've been through... Uh, all the readings that we've done. We've been developing this project for over a year and she's been with it from the very beginning. Uh, and you see her craft, like craft is something she has learned and that you can see how she uses it. But she also has this, this thing that you can't fake, that you can't, she has like magnetism to it. If she's <laughs> on stage, if she's in a silly studio reading a part, you can't take your eyes off of her. It's this magic, it's this like star quality that you look at her, you hear her, you sense her energy and you're drawn in like a magnet. And I think that, you know, we're going to try to unpack all about her journey. I think today's masterclass is really the journey of an actor. Not two journeys are alike, uh, you know, especially, Artists of colors have different challenging uh, journeys in the American theater. Uh, we might be living now in 
you know, I don't want to say a promised land, but we're now finally, finally, slowly entering a, a more just, a more represented uh, uh, realm of America. Although I had to say that, that sometimes you might feel like it's more represented on Broadway than across the regional theaters of America. Uh, and most actors work in the regional theater uh, because you know there's only 30 or some shows at the same time on Broadway. Uh, but although diversity is becoming better, um, a lot of the actors of our community of Miami, Miami is, uh, you know, we are 65% Hispanic, 20% Afro-American or, or Afro-Caribbean, and about 14% white Anglo. So most of our actors and our artists are Hispanic, Latinx, African-American, Afro-Caribbean. So we, many of, uh, of you here in the, in the group are, are, uh, are interested to see the journey of an actor through you know, that perspective, uh, which for our city is the majority perspective. It might not be true for America, but for our city it is. Um, uh, so uh, very long introduction to say how much I admire you, how, how much I'm excited that you are here talking to us today. And I feel that the audience are going to be very lucky to be hearing from you, to, 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 to seeing your voyage and what works for you as an actor, how you prepare, et cetera. So Lana, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It was a, a bit of a, a struggle with everything that's going on in the world today, you know, but um, I'm here it, and I want to give back. Yeah, and it, we were talking about that earlier today, that it feels strange to do activity while, you know, some of our parents, uh, friends' parents or our, our own family members are in the hospital. And, um, you know, we, we spoke about how important it was just to give something for free. We are not trying to raise money. We are not trying to bring awareness. We're trying to share our knowledge with, with the audience. Uh, a, a lot of people, and I'm seeing the list, a lot of people are, are, are actors of the community uh, and are people who, who, who want a little bit of uh, uh, insight on, on how they can advance their career. Because at the, at the end of the day, this might be a prolonged hibernation and we have to figure out how we want to spend that time and learning always seems to be a, a good idea. Right. So Lana, yes. tell us when, when you realized that you wanted to be a, a performer, a storyteller, an actor. Uh, I, I was probably around nine, nine years old. I would, I had my old tape recorder. I'm, I'm, I'm telling on myself, but uh, <laughs> press play, record the two buttons that go down. Right. Um, I used to tape myself in all these accents and make stories and write things. I kind of knew that then there was definitely a connection to storytelling. And where was that? What city? In Connecticut, Middlefield, Connecticut. Middlefield. What type of city is Middlefield, Connecticut? Not a city, but <laughs> what type of town is Middlefield, Connecticut? It's, it's so like the name says it's in the middle of a field. If you blink your eyes, you will miss it. Um, we were uh, one out of three um, black families in this community. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine the struggles that I had growing up. So was it uh, a city that it's near uh, New yeah, York? Harper, it's, it's, near, it's, about, Harper. it's about it's about two hours, two, three hours away from New York, up about a half an hour from Hartford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay. All right. So when you were nine, you, you started to do accents, record yourself. Uh, and then what happened? You know, how did that evolve into, into trying to... Well, okay. it's a great story, actually. Um, my mom, I, I love cats. And my mother, um, I wanted to get a cat. And my mom says, well, if you learn your timetables all the way to 12, we'll get you a cat. And I did very well. I didn't get quite to 12, um, 11 and some change. And she said, uh, we were sitting in the small Vega, um, I think it was a small Vega car, red car. And she had this clip, I still have, a clipping of uh, Matchy's Dance Studio um, in Durham, Connecticut. And she said, well, because you learned your timetables, not all the way, but you did so well, I'm going to give you dancing lessons instead. And I just was like, what are you, dancing lessons? And, I, and then it was, 
from that moment on, my career started just in that, in the arts, just because I wanted a cat. Now I have three cats with my fiance, but <laughs> <laughs> I have my cats now. <laughs> and, and so, so, so you, you were, were before anything a dancer, right? I mean, in fact, your first, I, I don't want to get too much ahead, but your, your first professional jobs were <laughs> as a dancer. Yeah. First love dancing. My mom said when I was really small, I would sing along to classical music, but singing was always something that was there, but in the back. And uh, dancing was in the front. So my my dream was to be in the ALA company. Um, oh yeah. As long as I can. yes. So you were you were taking dancing lessons. How how old were you when you started the dancing Nine. lessons? Nine. nine. I, was, so nine. I, was, I, was, I was older. I mean, that's pretty old to start dancing. Is it really? Oh. Yeah. Usually you start, I mean, people put their kids in five, as early as three. Um, nine is, is, is older, much older. And, you know, I, I put, my daughter wanted to be a flamenco dancer. I mean, she's still six, so she, she can be. But last year she begged me uh, and I, I took her to, to, to the class and, uh, and then she begged me a, a month later to take her out because it was so, she, she thought she was going to play around. It was so disciplined. And so that's not what, what, what. so what was, was the, dis, the discipline of dancing? Because dancing is a, it's, it's a very disciplined art form. Yeah. I think people don't you, really get it, right? Right. I think once you start dancing, you will always be disciplined. You're, perf I mean, we're, we per we're perfectionists. You know, we stand at the bar, we're, we're perfectionists. So everything right. that I applied myself to felt afterwards, singing, acting, it had to be perfect. Um, so yeah, and also the worth ethic is different, I think. So, yeah, we work and work and work and work. Yeah. Maybe a little bit too hard at first, but we, yeah. You know, direct. You know, I directed uh, musicals uh, both in Venezuela, here in, in the U.S. And for me, dancers always fascinated me because they're like a different breed than actors. <laughs> Much more disciplined, uh, and you know, they, they, in a way, actors. And, and I guess I, be, being a person of theater, find myself in the actor realm. Then we sort of there's like a juju that we believe in, like. Is today like was this a good performance? Did we did we you, you know did we did we do the character? Did the you know the, were we inspired, etc.? We're dancers. It's like no, that's all bullshit. It's like one, two, three, four. You know what I mean? Like you, there, there's this sort of like a direct and and no BS approach to the work that right. I find uh, dancers have that actors in a way uh, right. are, are. I don't know if you find that to be the case. Well. I think you have, you have all these types of dance. You have the passionate ones. I mean, that's why you have the ballet separate from the modern world because right. there's, you know, the Graham technique from the Horton technique. I think it's just what, what dance uh, rhythm you have. Like what, what is your, like I think in ballet, it's, there is a discipline there. Yes. All, all dance is discipline. All dance. So different, different colors, I would say, that dance has. Which so you were there from eight to nine until, uh, were you there all through high school? All through high school, yes. Um, and then I went to college, uh, Dean Junior College, and uh, my mother, I wanted to go straight to New York City. My mom's like, no, absolutely not. You go to college first, which was great because they were having auditions for the Ailey um, School. And uh, I got into the certificate program, but then Denise Jefferson, called my house. My mom was at the post office. She called my house and says, I would like to give you a full scholarship. I remember my mom walking in. I was like, mom, sit down. <laughs> and, and I got a full scholarship to Ailey. And that started my, my journey in New York City. So how long were you with the company? I, I was in, in school for two years. And then I got into the second company, right. which is uh, um, Alan Ailey Repertory Ensemble. I was there for two years about, and my dream was to be in the first company. But at that time, there was a woman called Deborah Manning that left, and she was a short, uh, black, dark skinned black girl, and I'm not that. So they hired my friend Solange Sandy, who got that job, and I was just devastated. I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> what? But because I had that mind of like, keep going, I, 
auditioned for Donald Bird, the group, and got into, they were looking for one dancer, and I got into that immediately. Till I realized this is not exactly what I want to do. Um, right. Dancing. And so how did the world of acting uh, come to you? What was, it, what, was your next, what was your next step? Uh, I did after... uh, the Euro European tour of hair. Right, you did the, the European tour of hair. That was your first experience in musical theater. Yeah, actually that was my first musical theater experience. Like my first, first, first one. How did you get that job? Um, EPA. Well, EPA, so for, for those of you who, so but you were already a member of Actors' Equity? No, actually not. No, so it, was, it was one of those. Like, oh, EPA, so I, it was more like a cattle call. That's exactly right. what it is. It was so. So for those of you who, who who don't know what we're talking about, most shows are sort of like forced to do a an open uh, casting for the union, uh, the actors' union, and sometimes, including Miami New Drama, we also let non-union people come. They can't. Um, you know, if you're an actor, if you, if you're from Equity, you can schedule. Uh, your own time to be seen. If not, you sort of like wait in line, uh, you know, to- And hope to be seen. <laughs> and hope to be seen, that's right. Um, and, and I have to say, people assume that we don't hire the people who do that. But even for this show, uh, for A Wonderful World, we ended up hiring a, a, a big group of people who sort of like were not a member of the union and just like came in and waited to see if we would see them. And it happens time and time again. Um, so I think it's reassuring that that's how your extraordinary career got started, just by, by waiting in line. And well, so my first Broadway show also. I know. And we'll get there in a, in a second. Okay. Let, let, let's wait. Uh, let's, let's wait. Let's wait for that. So, so hair, where was it? The hair tour. And what, what production was that? Who, who directed that production? Gosh, who directed? I should have written that down. We were directed, I believe it was yeah. James Grail that did that. We were actually fortunate to, to work with him. That was my James Rado, who was the man who wrote the music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, uh, and, and, and where was the tour? Uh, we started in Austria, I believe. So it was Austria, Germany, Switzerland. This was a long time ago. Yes. And, uh, and so you spent a year in, with the company? How long? Um, I believe that it was a total of seven to eight months I was on tour. Bus and truck, which is hard. Yeah. Very it's, hard. Yeah. You get up, you do a show, you drive the next day to another place. So probably it was a non-equity show, obviously. I oh, mean, it's if it tours, it was non-equity. So when, when, it, when it's outside of the union, and typically everything outside of the U.S., it's non-union. Producers tend to do as many shows as they can, and actors are sort of a, sometimes a commodity. I don't know if that was experience for this show, but, but sometimes it's yep. uh, it, it's really hard for for actors, and some of them, you know, their their instrument get damaged, which is their voice, etc. Because uh, that's uh, that, that's hard on them. Yeah. So so you had you you were young, you had a, a, a you know very famous show, you toured Europe, and then you're back in New York. Back in New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, waiting tables, coat checking, right. paying my dues, basically, pounding the pavement, auditioning for this, that, the other, auditioning. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, uh, it, it is, uh, I mean, it's the life of an actor, you, you know, I, I, it's just, uh, even, you know, accomplished actors, we, sometimes it's hard while you're waiting uh, for your next thing, not, not to have to be a waiter or be a, you know, a coat checker and, um, right. Uh, it seems like that is the life one chooses. No, there's a moment in which, in a way, uh, you're allowed to this very, very elite room. There are only two percent of people are in, in which you you don't have to do that anymore. But for the majority of people, even you know, Tony nominated people, there's a point where you sort of have to go back to day jobs. Uh, and then after that, then you wonder why, you know, what is it about acting that you're willing to be as talented as you are and eat so much shit along the way? Right? <laughs> I think that's what makes you the best actor you can be is that you, you, uh, you lived, you, you, you tell a story, you're living, a, you're living the story that you end up telling in the end. You, you just tell of all of your experiences, all your frustrations, all your, 
your anger, your, your sadness, your joys. And it, hopefully you're able to speak that language through your work. So you are, you are waiting, you're, you're waiting tables, co-checking, et cetera. You did hair. And then what happened? Um, my friend was walking down the street and says, you know, Lion King is auditioning. And I said, well, isn't that that cartoon? He said, yeah, but they're auditioning for people. You should get on in, in on that and audition for Lion King. That was in the early 90s, and, and, and it was the first time that, that, that this, Disney chose sort of an avant-garde director. Yes, Julie Tamer. Yes. Julie Tamer, who came off of the Los Angeles Festival, where she did all this awesome work. Um, and, and then they, they gave her this massive big project. Uh, and so, but, but before, so that was one of the big shows that, you know, they wanted an African-American cast. Yes. What was, what was it before? Like, were you, did you feel like, oh, here's all the things that are casting and the small groups are the ones that I can audition to? Was that your experience? No, actually, I was on a long line around the corner. No, at meaning eight, before the Lion King, meaning before the Lion King. It, you feel that like there was enough opportunities for you as an actor? Oh, gosh. I, no, I, I definitely not. Not at that time. No. So, 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 so you hear about the Lion King and, 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 and what do you do? Well, um, I go online and wait for, I believe it was six hours. Outside, in the streets. Yeah. In the street, it, was warm, it was warm. So it was uh, 890 Broadway uh, where they would audition around. Yeah. It was a long time. I sing, I think, 12 bars or 16 bars. And I, I picked Try from Janis Joplin, which is completely not musical theater at right. all. And when you're, when you're in that stage, you just sing whatever you feel good at. And, and you can sing well. And they asked me in the room, Lana, do you dance? And I literally jumped into first position. I said, sure do. <laughs> all right. And we and, had three, uh, days, three days auditioning. And... Uh, made it to the end and basically got the call in uh, my friend's uh, photo studio saying you, you booked the job. And you, you had no agent at the time? No agent. So you got into the hottest show <laughs> yes. of Broadway history uh, ever without an agent, yes. just with your absurd talent waiting in line waiting for in six line. hours to be seen. I just want to pause here for a second. <laughs> No, because this is big. And I think that everybody, you know, no excuses, no excuses. I mean, if you, if, if you have the will and you wait uh, and, you know, and, you, and you know that you have a talent and you are able to be seen, doors open. And this is an extraordinary story. So your career really started because you waited in line. Yes. No agent, no nothing. And you got up. That's amazing. Thank That's you. Amazing. So how Sometimes was I think about it? And I think it's just what I just do. You know, how, how was I... being part of the original company of, of this iconic musical? How was it being part of it? Yes. Was it, was it, well, all... we, were the, we were the hottest ticket in town and I've never been, you know, when we won the Tony, I, I, I never felt that uh, before. I mean, I was, I started as a dancer and it eight shows a week, you know, even on my, my double shows, I would go and take yoga between double shows. <laughs> well, uh, I know you take yoga now because I've seen you. Between a double show day. Yeah, that's insane. I was insane. So did you just do the New York? Were you there in the out of town? No, no. I, yeah, we started in Minneapolis. Uh -huh. So you were there in the Minneapolis. And was that, a, no, did Julie Tamer have a, uh, the, her appendix burst or something during tech in Minneapolis? Is that, is that, was that the case? That, that's a myth. Or, no, I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Okay, so in Minneapolis, how was the show? How did how much did the, the show change from? A lot, a lot. We definitely had a, quite a few show stops, um, but I can't remember everything that changed because it's so long ago. But I remember that the change, uh, the cha the show did change a lot. 
before it came to New York City. And now that it's in New York City, it's even more changed. Even when I went to go see it for the 20th anniversary, I was like, oh, that's different. Really? Huh. <laughs> and they cut, certain, like, they cut a few of the, the scenes that were just too long. Interesting. And yeah. so, so, so you, how long were you yeah. just a dancer on the original company? When was the first time? So, so, so you ended up going from being a, uh, you know, a dancer on the show to playing the female lead. Yeah, well, I was an understudy of Shensi at the time, um, but I uh, watched Heather Headley in the, in, the, in the wings all the time because I mm -hmm. thought she was the cat's meow and still do think yeah. she's the cat's meow. And um, as a dancer, we learn things by seeing, seeing it. Um, and so I would go home every night and sing Shadowlands at the top of my lungs at 180th Street. And one day she um, oh, was on stage and uh, is a part, uh, she's going to eat me, dun, 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 dun. you know, this one scene. She fell and twisted her, her ankle. And her understudy was, both of her understudies were out. And I, I, I ran upstairs and I, because it was just quiet. Curtain comes down and I look at Aubrey Lynch, who was a dance captain at that time. I said, I know all her lines. And he says, really? He said, I bet you do. And that <laughs> night I went on for, for Nala without, I was in her understudy, nothing. I went on that night as uh, Nala and then became the understudy after that. Understudy. This is another extraordinary <laughs> learning opportunity. You know, people are expected like, oh, I didn't get to be an understudy, but you decided that you were an understudy nonetheless. You decided that you, you, up on yourself that you were going to know the track of everyone. I mean, well, yeah, they, of everyone, they, but at least of those that you admire. Well, yeah, I just I learned it, and just because I thought she was just phenomenal, and and then I would go home and practice it, and I knew everything. And so you went in for her I in, went the, on in the middle on, of the show. On, no, it was, uh, one of the girls finished with script in hand. Right. Oh, um, one of the singers, and I'm a dancer. I went on that night, Saturday night. I went on and I performed, and I remember stepping away from the tribe. You know, shadow man, Lisa, you know. Right. I remember, and I remember feeling that spotlight for the first time, and I'll never forget it because it was the most beautiful feeling I've ever felt in my beginning of my career. Wow, and what a bar, huh? What a bar to, to look back at and, 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 and to yeah, return to. I, I, I was saying, Tom Schumacher, when I bump into him from time to time, president of Disney. President of Disney Theatrical, sure. Yeah, he also my would teacher say, at school. Great guy. Um, he said, I, I uh, love that story. We tell it, he said, but I embellish it just a little bit. I'm like, well, what do you do that I levitate? <laughs> you know, so oh. it's, it's a... They had a saying in Lion King, and people still remember it. Watch your back. Lana Gordon knows your track. <laughs> well, I saw here uh, Jason Williams, who, who's here with Hi, us. Hi, uh, and, and, and I think that he should be terrified. He played Louis Armstrong, and, and I think he should definitely watch his back. Uh, <laughs> because, yes. Because Lana is there for you, baby. Honey, um, I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna take it all. Yeah, and, and we have to do something with, with just on here in the future, um, yeah. with with the master classes. Uh, and um, and so you, so how long were you Nala for? How many? Performances? Well, I, I I became her understudy off and on. So um, I wanted to do the role, um, and it came a time where they were gonna change over Nala's, and I didn't get it. Um, and so uh, the company manager at the time said, well, sometimes you have to leave, leave for them to see who you are. So you left the most popular show in the history uh, of Broadway? Yes. And where did you go? I went to the revival uh, in the year 2000, Jesus Christ Superstar. So that was the Australian production, was that the... No, it, that, was, that. it was, yeah, exactly, right, yeah. Right, right, right. Uh, I, I went across the street at the Ford, to the Ford Theater, literally across the street to perform as a soul sister there. Uh, and then Disney called me, called me and says, Lana, the role of Shenzi has opened. Do you want the role? 
the the full role Shemzi is Lana the full role that's and that's one of the most uh, I would say funniest tracks on, yeah, on the show. Funny. The first week I went on, I wasn't funny at all. <laughs> that's hard to believe. And by that time, did you did you have an agent? By that time, uh, yes. By that time, I had. Wait, did I? No. Yes. By then, I had an agent. Oh. Uh, I got in. I got my. I do have a story about my first commercial agent because as in Lion King, I was the cheetah. And um, I got mentioned in the New Yorker magazine as wow. this word, the wordlessly astonishing cheetah that crosses the stage. And I was sending all my headshots out at the same time when that magazine came in. And Did so, you put the quote? With the quote. And so Mickey Shahara from Innovative Artists says, I want to know the woman that was mentioned along with all of the principals. You were the only member of the chorus who was me mentioned. Yeah. That's a pretty big deal. Yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty big deal. Oh, well, it was humbling. That it's, 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 you know, to, to to listen to myself and hear about my own story. You know, I don't I don't talk about myself like this, but it's it's to hear it. I get you know I don't think oh God I'm amazing. I just feel like this is just the journey that I. So I, I can remind you that you are. No, oh, problem. thank you. Jeff. And thank so you. and so we are now. You're Shenzi on on Broadway. Two years uh, for two years. Eight shows a week. Eight shows a week. But not a hard track at all. That's not a hard track. Uh, it's a fun track, yeah. But it's a, it's, it's a fun. Great, yeah. We have pretty much the first act and then a couple scenes in the second. In the end, towards the end. So, you know, it's an easy. So, oh, I got this, you know. <laughs> so were you auditioning throughout or you were just committed to staying? I, a, I did a lot of commercials, a, a lot of commercials, a lot of print ads at that time when that's when commercials and print ads were paying great money and I booked sure. a lot then. So listen, we have a couple of questions and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna set a time a little bit later for, the, for those questions. But meanwhile, I think that, uh, uh, you know, what do you recommend for young actors starting in the industry? And Natalie, uh, uh, Henry is um, asking you. So what, okay. what do you recommend for young actors? Well, for young actors, what I recommend, uh, hone in on your craft know what you're you know know what you're good at work on that and when you get into the room like i i was saying i say to all my young inspiring actors actresses performers don't take anything personally right don't take anything if you don't get cast don't take yeah, it personally yeah, it's not personal just keep working on yourself keep inspiring yourself keep yourself up and coming and with Listen to other actors, listen to other people that have made it, because they have a story. When you were, so when you were in between Hair and The Lion King, were you still taking dance classes in New York? Yes. Were you continuing your, so, so another advice is always continue with your training. Training is never done. You, yes. You, you, always you can never stop go, learning. Never yes. stop learning. It, whether it's an actor studio or a, or a dance studio, you always have to be a member of a training. You always have to continue training. Yeah, and expand yes. your horizon. Do other things that make you uncomfortable. Okay, so Jay, has, have you come across someone who has just started a career after 30 with no dance training, a good voice, and good natural acting skills? If so, do you see them become successful? Of course, of course. And, and, and you know, it's interesting. So, so people in their 30s who have, let's say, a, 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 a no dance training, but, but, but some facility to move and and a good voice. You know, there's quite a bit of opportunities, I think. Um, I, I guess it's bad for the industry, but good for, for people like that, that a lot of Broadway shows are touring non-equity. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And it's very easy to find a 24, 22, 21 year old, non-equity, brilliant actor, because by that, time, by that age, most people are not equity. But then when you go into the 30s and 40s, it's really hard to find good non-equity actors. So if you are, a, 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 you know, in your 30s or even in your 40s and you think you have, it, it actually might be easier to get into it. Yeah, you know, I never, I never, you know, Michelle, I never thought about that. But, you know, the, I think the non-equity definitely helps a lot of people that are older um, get their first start. So actually, it's, it's kind of nice for them. Sort of Listen, Fiddler on the Roof, it's a huge show, did a non-equity tour 
uh, in Miami, uh, you know, in the fall. And, and a lot of the shows that shouldn't, shouldn't be uh, non-equity show are non-equity shows. Uh, and, uh, a, 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 and in a way, I think overall it hurts the industry, um, a, but it definitely gives opportunity for, for Yeah, people. it's a lot of give and take yeah. there. So yeah. what are some tools for young black girls trying to make it, Anya Sanders asked. Young black girls, well, you know, don't categorize yourself. I mean, I think, you know, you are a young aspiring actress. I, I think it's important to see yourself, you know, I, I understand that there's a lot of the black, the light skin, the dark skin, the skinny, the, you know, I, I get all of that. But we're all human beings, and especially right now, we're the most This human. is a good moment. Definitely, this is a good moment. And it's funny because, like, Miami New Drama is now suffering because, you know, in, in the last few years, uh, the, 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 the type of, uh, of actors we normally cast are now today very hard to get because there's seven tours of Hamilton. There are, you know, there, there's so much, there's so much uh, uh, opportunities that, 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 you know, that uh, uh, the people who have been waiting for the longest time are finally receiving the Getting you know, their acclimation. attention. So yeah, but, but it's, listen, I, I mean, most theater and I've worked in other regional theaters uh, across the country, uh, you know, there is, a dominant narrative in the American theater. It, it has been very white Anglo. Um, and yes, for a very has. long time, Hispanic characters have rarely made an appearance. Black actors are, you know, are 50% maids, etc. cetera. Um, and that takes a toll in how the country sees themselves. That's why I, I am very passionate about bringing the work of Miami New Drama into schools because you know the work we do typically are about black superheroes, Hispanic superheroes, et cetera. And so when you're a kid and you are seeing people who look like you being freaking superheroes on stage, you know, kicking ass, then you are empowered by saying like, oh, this is my story. My story, can, I right. can be there. And I think that's, that's extremely, an extremely powerful thing uh, for, for youth to, to, not, to not think that they are the others in a country dominated by a different narrative. Um, well, I know that when I played Chicago in right, New York, and, I would come out of the stage door and these young, black, Hispanic, young girls would say, you look like me. I that, can that, that Velma Kelly, you played Velma Kelly, and we're, we're gonna go there in a second, but, uh, but that, that must have been a huge deal, right? Were you... Uh, <laughs> How not many only let me be, uh, I'm not your typical Velma Kelly. I have my, I use, they let me use my hair. So they really give, they gave Velma Kelly what I look like. Right. Not like the typical Bob, not that. That's impressive. Which inspired these young girls to go for their their dreams go and say that we can do this too one girl was like i can do this i saw you i can do this um so uh, so we, we have a a few other questions what is the process like to become an, an equity actor uh you, you can answer that but, but pretty much you, you know you have to get points you gotta, you gotta pay, pay get your points pay your dues do as many shows you can and eventually you'll get your equity card eventually right. Well, it's a process. So, so here's another question. If you are a young actor, let's say if you are a, a, a young African-American or a young Hispanic actor in a city like Miami, like Chicago, like LA, or like Fargo, you know, like <laughs> when is it worth going to New York and when are you better off staying in your city? Do you not go to New York? Do you go to Atlanta? Like, if you were starting your career now, do you think going to New York would still be the most um, You the mean most if logic? I start right now where I am, like the age I am at now? Or? Well, no, I mean, if you were starting, like, do you think that today still going to New York is the most logical place to go if you're an aspiring actor or a young actor? Let's call it a young actor. I think there's a lot more hubs now. I think we have Atlanta. Um, that's really big on, on TV and film, um, LA, but New York City, 
there's something to be said about New York City. There's a grunge there. There's a fight. There's a there's a bit of a struggle there um, that makes the actor just a little bit more raw. I don't know if that makes any sense. So, so Jason Williams, who's a, <laughs> the, the star of a wonderful world and a very humble man himself, is amazing. Is asking uh, a couple of questions. How important is it to be kind and communicative with your fellow actors? Uh, do you have to get along and who is this Jason Williams and how amazing is he to book a role as a lead in a wonderful world? Well, that man is impressive. He's going to get uh, the Tony. for the world. Yes, well, I mean, it's impressive. What he does is outstanding. It's outstanding work. We locked out uh, when we found him. Uh, it, it was really, a, you know, when, when you see, the, the big fear of this show is that it relied on an actor doing Louis Armstrong, but you couldn't do an imitation of him, right? You needed to, because you have freedom with Lil Harding. Nobody knows what Lil Harding looked like, what he sounded like, like what, right. yeah, you did whatever you wanted with that character. But when you're doing Louis Armstrong, everybody knows what, everybody expects something, everybody expects the voice, everybody expects, you know, and, and, you, and you have to deliver that, but creating a character that it's not him, that it's your interpretation of him. So, Anyways, well, as I said, we'll have, we'll have just son here uh, in a future master class um, and, and we'll talk with him more. Um, but how important it is to be uh, in communication. Oh gosh, I think uh, it's, it's, it's so important because then you can really get, if you have a nice feeling or a nice camaraderie with your fellow actors, you can play off them a lot easier. I think if there's there's tension, it's it just doesn't feel nice, and you have to break through that tension to get to the scene. And I think it's just a waste of energy. So Juson and I had a really great uh, camaraderie on stage where we just fed off of one another. And I think that's the beauty of acting is that we're no longer saying the lines, but we're just in the scene together. Yeah, and you can see the energy is, uh, you can't fake it, right? It's a, no. it's a thing, it's a, you, you can't fake it. There's a, there's a few more questions, uh, and, and I'm gonna do a couple of them and then we're gonna continue with your journey and then we'll continue with questions. But um, Alexis Santiago said, I just got offered an equity contract for a production at a theater company here in Los Angeles. Congratulations. And LA is a city where it's worth going equity. Well, gosh, I, you know, I don't, I can't answer that question because I've never been to LA as a musical theater, but I think it doesn't matter where you are. I think it's just a matter of what you're getting out of that moment from what role are you doing, but what you're getting out of that moment. And you can take it from where, from there and go somewhere else. So I think it's just a matter of what, what, your, what kind of work you're doing at that moment. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you are. New York City is one hub of it, but it doesn't matter, I think. You know, uh, it's, uh, it's always a, it's a balance at a certain age where people are saying, do I go equity or do I continue in the non-equity track where there is a ton of opportunities of different level, you know. The, right. The, the, the two, so, so it's always, a, you know, but I, I, I said nobody said, oh, I shouldn't have gone equity. That ruined my career. That doesn't happen, right? Never, I mean, definitely, never, never. There is a never. choice an important choice to measure, but I've never seen anyone saying like the worst thing I did in my life was join equity. So if that's a choice you make, it'll never be a bad choice. No, I, I, I agree in a hundred percent. So Jay Jones said, what are your thoughts on regional theater primarily seeking talent in New York versus their own area? Listen, that, that is a, a, a very important um, question. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to try to answer that because it, uh, as a producer, artistic director of a theater, I, that, that's not my, you know, there's something very interesting that happens, for example, in a community like Miami. Miami uh, has a really interesting theater community, uh, a lot of very interesting companies. Most of those, comp those companies uh, tend to be sort of wide Anglo companies that do wide Anglo stories. Um, and... Uh, and some of them are extraordinarily good at what they do. Uh, but what has happened is it's sort of the type of actors where, that you find here that work constantly and are very good are a lot of wide angle actors because they get a ton of opportunities and then 
and a lot of the actors of color leave Miami. So we, you know, for us, it's interesting. We tend to bring a lot of, and it's, it, it's not just, you know, uh, actors, directors like Carl Caulfield, uh, writers like Orrin Squire, they all leave. So we, so part of our mission is we to love bring to, bring, <laughs> to bring back, to bring back those actors uh, to Miami. Um, uh, and, y you know, we always do, we always try to uh, cast, at least half of our show locally, but sometimes you can. But you know, so sometimes uh, you know we are we are definitely. I mean, this is going to be a little rough to, to say, uh, but we are more committed to the idea that we need to tell multicultural, multilingual uh, stories. Uh, so we have a commitment to the community. Beautiful. Uh, a little bit more than. To the artistic community, uh, meaning that if we're we're going to try to find the, the best actors we can, hopefully, and most of the time, at least half of them are from Miami. But what we really want is that artistic excellence is something that is is in intertwined with multicultural, multilingual storytelling, and I, and I think that artistic excellence that what we're trying to achieve. Uh, through the lens of multicultural and multilingual theater is our ultimate goal. Uh, and, and, uh, and we're lucky enough, well, you, you, you saw how many people from a, from a wonderful world are local. Um, yes. Uh, you know, from, from the great Nicole Henry, who's a, oh my God, she's a, she's a goddess and, and all, you know, and the cast is, you know, half of the cast is local. So we, you know, definitely. Listen, the Cubans, the show we did, the Cubans was 100%. All of them are Miami actors. Half of them came from New York to do the show because oh, they're, get, yeah. they're, getting, they're getting work in New York and not in Miami. So, you know, a, a lot of our shows are sometimes even 100% locally, uh, but we, we, we try to go to artistic excellence. Sometimes you're not going to find an actor who has the talent of, or you might be lucky, you know, to do a, a job like what Jason is doing on a local EPA because an actor like that is not going, this is not Atlanta. If you're that talented, you're not going to be sticking in Miami where your opportunities are limited and you'll go to New York, you'll go to Atlanta, you go to somewhere else. So it's hard to find sometimes certain actors of certain caliber in Miami because once you're of that range, you leave because you're, the opportunities in Miami are, it, it, it's not the case. I mean, you really have some phenomenal actors of all races in Miami who could, who could definitely, you know, be in the big leagues on Broadway, absolutely. But generally speaking, you're better off, uh, you know, sometimes leaving. And, that, and that's sad for, for somebody who, who really wants people to stay in Miami, right? Um, okay, so uh, we said, uh, what, are, what do you do when you find yourself in a hard place where there isn't any bookings for you at a young age, says Anya Sanders. Oh gosh, keep plugging away. Just keep going, keep driving yourself, keep immersing yourself in uh, as many people that you admire, just keep watching, learning, keep, keep auditioning. It's not, it's, it's, not a, it's not an easy road. It's gonna be ebb and flow. When you flow, it flows. When it ebbs, it ebbs, you, it's just what it is. It's the reality of this beast that we we live in. But have remain a pot, you know, have a positive outlook. Know that you're gonna get to where you're gonna get and what you're gonna get. You're gonna get what's rightfully yours, no matter what. You know, it's been it's it's been almost a decade or so since I, or a little bit less than a decade, but let's say I I got to New York more than ten years ago and, and a lot of people that I know were sort of like starting there and throughout the last 15 years or so, many people have just very talented people, just especially actors, just quit because it's so hard to wait. And those who don't quit, they make it. Make they it. Make it's a, 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 and it, it, it might seem like, like sort of like where we're living now in this, like, when will this end? Well, would the quarantine end? How long can I take this? Um, and those actors who are driven enough, it's sometimes it's not a matter of talent. It's about a matter of 
hanging. And the more you hang out, the more casting directors see you, the more they see you again, the more they see you again, the more somebody else sees, you know, it, 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 you, you become, you're, the, you're somebody that other people think about when they're casting. Anyways, we're gonna to return to the questions in a second, but, but uh, so, so we are, you, you are back on, uh, on working for Disney, on the Lion King, and then what have you, two years doing Shenzi, and, and then uh, what happened? Um, and then Jeff Lee, who was uh, uh, directing, not directing, but like serving as the, what are they, what are they called when they uh, serve as the director when the director's not? Right, the associate, the associate director. Associate, thank you. Um, or the resident director as well, yeah. Resident director, that's what I'm looking for. Um, after two years, I was ready to buy an apartment. I was ready to like, okay, you know, I've got some great money coming in. And I get a call from Disney and they said, we are not going to extend your contract. And I was like, what? And I remember I was crying between the cars to my mother, devastated. What am I going to do? And my mom said, you're going to be fine. I, I, I feel like this is a great thing. Yeah, but mommy's not hand on my nose. Like, but still, what am I going to do? And then um, I auditioned for West Side Story because I keep going. I auditioned for West Side Story for Anita. And I got that. So that mm -hmm. was a definite different take. A whole nother color of musical theater. Um, so I just hopped around from here to there. Um, but what got me to, I, I actually ended up moving to Europe for 10 years. You spent a decade in, mainly in Germany, no? Were you, or? Germany, I was, I was about Aust six years in Austria and then the rest in Germany. So why, why, why did you move to Germany? What did you learn in Germany? You know, I was, I was actually, believe it or not, I was one of those frustrated New York actors going, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, what am I doing? And I moved to Europe because I, I uh, did West Side Story over there with the, uh, Joy McNeely, um, BB mm -hmm. Pro uh, Productions. Um, and then I met my, uh, I met someone over there and, you know, love takes you across the way. That yes. was a different time. Wasn't the greatest thing in the end, but um, I ended up staying in Europe for 10 years and doing a lot of shows in Germany in the language of German. Oh, wow. So you, you were doing, so it, was it phonetic for you? Did you learn the language in, in or was it? In the beginning, it was phonetic, purely wow. phonetic. Um, and my last job that I got um, as a musical theater German actor <laughs> was Chicago. And I played Velma Kelly in Chicago, in, not in Chicago, in Germany, in German. Huh. Wow. What an accomplishment. I mean, what an accomplishment of doing one, you know, a lead in a show in a language, not your own yeah. people. You can do whatever you, <laughs> you set your mind. your mind in German out of every, tell me in Italian or something, but in German. Oh my yeah. God. That, that really, that just yeah. speaks so highly of your, of your caliber as an actor. It's un, un, unbelievable. And I did that role for a year. Um, I didn't get the best reviews because of my accent, German accent, not German accent, American accent. So um, I would write on my mirror though, before I would write on my mirror, I am Velma Kelly on Broadway. And I would look at my when you know mirror every day and look at it and go I am and I didn't say I want I said I am Velma Kelly on Broadway and so when they when when Germany when because we performed in Stuttgart and when uh we were going to transfer the show to Berlin and I was like I'm going to Berlin it's Velma Kelly I got another call and says you are not going to Berlin they are going to hire somebody else. Devastated. Um, the producer flew in and she said, you know, I think you would, basically, this is what she said, I think you will be better off in New York City. 
Mm. That's all she said. So she said, you feel free to take some time off. So I took a couple of shows off and I went back. And when someone tells me that I can't do something well, I will tell them in my best way. And literally I went from here to there. Mm. And when the producers saw me that last show in Stuttgart, I knew that they were kicking themselves that they weren't taking me with them. So I ended up seeing the girl that they hired. And I emailed Duncan Stewart. Duncan Stewart, like, our hey, casting director. I Duncan said, hi, Duncan, Lana here. Um, I'm going to be in New York City this and this and time. I'd love to meet. So we met and he said, Lana, this never happens, but, but Amra Faye is going to be gone for seven weeks. Would you like to audition for Walter Bobby? Mm -hmm. And I said, yes. And um, I prepared myself within those two weeks to like, you know, get everything all of the English in my head because I had the German right. in my head. <laughs> and to like break that. And literally I went in and I had a three hour audition, one hour with the musical director, one hour with the dance captain, one hour with uh, Duncan. You know, break, not one hour one, but you know, you get that. Right. Anyway, Walter Bobby comes in, gives me a couple of directions here and there, and I took the direction, and they were like, "Okay, Lana, wait outside," and I waited outside, and went, "Man, I didn't get that. Man, I messed that up. Oh, I should have known that better." And then I remember Duncan uh, brought me back in the room, and he says, "Welcome to Broadway." Oh my God! Oh my God! What a story! So. But but I, but I wish people really, you know, before that Welcome to Broadway was too heartbreaking moment in which I'm sure you thought like, this is all over. Disney not asking you to come back, stood, you know, Chicago and Germany asking you not to go to Berlin and then Welcome to Broadway. I just, you know, it's important for people to know that Welcome to Broadway comes with the other two. I'm getting chills thinking about the journey. You know, I left my very secure, financially secure life. 10 years of hard work for seven weeks on Broadway hmm. that ended up turning into almost four years off and on. That's unbelievable. I mean, I mean, seven weeks, I literally said, I, I have this hunch that I need to go back. I want to be in the pool of, I want to be along, I want to be in the pool of great actors, great performers. I want to be, inspire me, motivate me, make me feel as though I want to, I wanted to work harder. Not to say that I didn't work hard in Germany. It's a different, different beast over there. It's a different pool. It's a smaller pool. New York City is huge. The pool is so big and the competition is fierce. Fierce. It's fierce. fierce. And you know what? The fierce competition makes you better and better and better and better and better. Oh, absolutely. There, no doubt, no doubt about it, but what a journey. So, so, so why, you know, and, and you still, you still are on and off on, uh, on Chicago to this day. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So why, why, and this is, you know, why would, you take the risk of spending two to three months out of New York to work oh. on a musical in Little Miami. All right, this role, this opportunity has been the moment I might get emotional. This has been, for me, the moment that I have waited for all my life. All my life to create something that is mine, that is my voice on it. That, you know, I'm working with the creative team. Everyone's new. We have such a great producers, some great artists. This is this is the moment of my life that I feel like this is what I've worked so hard for. As 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 um, Dion would say, you know, I want my name on those clothes. Um, <laughs> you know. I don't want to, someone else said it, uh, I think Stephen D'Angelo's daughter said, you know, I want to walk in my own shoes, not someone else's okay. dirty shoes. Yeah. It's incredible because you really, like, I don't know how much people really understand that when you are doing a world premiere musical, oh. uh, 
uh, or, or play, the actors really are writing it with you. Oh my, yes, I mean, I, I, working with 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 a uh, with the director Christopher, he he allowed us to create yeah. and bring our ideas. Who does that? Velma Kelly is. This is what it is. Right. Tarzan, Kala, this is what it is. Nala, this is what it is. Shanti, this is what it is. Lil Hardin, Louis Armstrong, you know, uh, all the characters. We get a chance to create and bring our passion, our 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 will, our need, our fight, everything to this these roles. And I'm I feel fortunate that I was again Duncan Stewart recommended what a, what a, yes there's okay yes when we were doing the reading he just gave us names of a few people and, <laughs> right. and almost everyone ended up being in the in the final production first of all Duncan Stewart is so good at, at a casting director like that guy like really like well he sees things that that we as actors don't see in ourselves he sees this little seed that he's like you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna take that seat and I, I'm gonna show this person and other people, but I'm gonna, he sees things that we don't, we don't see. Or also in the producing side, he has such a sophisticated eye and understands the character. Like, and especially like we think we as directors or as producers, we really go deep in and understand, but he goes uh, a, an extra step and really understand, sees actors with different light. They, I don't know, I think that the people, sometimes undervalue the work of what a casting director does. And Duncan is sort of an example of somebody who would change how your show or your play is because he's giving you the right ingredient. Now, the difference between, you know, doing tomato soup with the absolute best tomato in the world or, you know, with, you know, supermarket, low quality supermarket. I mean, it's just two different flavors and, and you, can't, you, can't, you can't fake you know, when somebody is prepared, uh, you know, to do that role. And it's impressive what you've done. I mean, really, what everybody in the cast has done. This is an, an extraordinary cast. Uh, and you, and it's impressive to see because, you know, I, I've been with, you know, we, 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 we commissioned, we started this place. So we know when he, I saw it when it was a, a treatment. And I saw it when it was just the first act. And, I, and really, those characters meant nothing to me when I was reading it the first time. Uh, but then that, that two week reading, you guys made it your own. Uh, and, and now those characters are in a way, uh, for my eyes, they, they, you know, they're one and the same with you. Um, and, and the beauty of it is that we all have the certainty that this will go to Broadway because the show is outstanding. And when it does, at some point, there's gonna be somebody doing all the choices you made because the resident director is gonna tell them to do exactly what exactly. Lana Gordon. That's the beautiful thing about creating and, a role. Yeah. Th that is. That is. You put, you put your stamp on it. You put your stamp, your passion, your love, your everything. You put it in. It's forever yours, in history. Indeed, I, I think that that takes some time for some uh, more questions. Um, so, Jason, I've worked with Lana Gordon in the past. She's the best on and off stage. I agree with that. But most amazing characteristic is her enthusiasm. You were a witness to that today. And uplifting of other actors as they go through the yes. journey. Who Thank you were you that. inspired by to give so much more than just scene work? Just Son Williams, the star of Our Wonderful World, who plays a brilliant, mm -hmm. uh, Louis Armstrong is asking. So the question is, who's inspired me? Who has inspired me to be that person? Yeah. My mother. Aha. Uh -huh. Unpack that a little bit for us. Well, my mother is, in, I mean, my companion, I mean, it's, we have all these other actors that I in, admire, obviously, you know, the Tarajis, you know, that, you know, like Tarajis, only one Taraji, but, uh, <laughs> but my mother, she's the one that, you know, be humble, be mm -hmm. compassionate. That's where you find the truth. Mm -hmm. in yourself and in others. Be compassionate. So my mother has taught me how to be the best I can be. Oh, I don't know uh, if, that any, if that answers your question, Jusan. A beautiful tribute to a mother to yeah. continue on that. You know, that is absolutely a beautiful. Yeah, Patrice, 
I admire so many actors. I can't just play, I can't just pick one. But, but you know, but there is a theme, I think, that you've had a good, uh, you have a good attitude. And you, you can experience things as defeat victories, depending on how you view them. And I think that the fact that before that, welcome to Broadway, you know, you had two very rough, uh, uh, you know, we're sorry, sorry, Lana. Devastating, devastating. Like I thought, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? How am I going to get further in my career in Germany as an actor if I've been already, I looked at it as like, not blackballed, but basically you won't work in a big production over here again. Yeah. Because people are always going to look at you like, oh, your German wasn't good enough. It was good, but not good enough. All right. But I showed them. So Patrice says, was there a time, whether early in your career or late on, where you felt you weren't seeing growth in yourself, perhaps in comparison to what others say? If so, how did you handle that? That's a very interesting question. Were you, was there maybe when you were in Germany for like, you feel you were sort of like stuck at a level and you needed something to take you on to the next level? Were you sometimes complacent? Well, I, I gosh, I, I, I think I'm always uh, thinking I'm not growing enough in certain situations, but I think Germany was definitely a place where um, I always felt like I was standing in place never learning enough, never getting that German language completely rolling off my tongue. It just wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. As, as much as I worked on it, as much as I did all the, the schooling and the training, it just never clicked for me, enough for me to stay. Hmm. Hmm. It never clicked. And I think I was the reason for it never clicking because in the back of my mind, I always paid on my SAG, my equity, I always paid my dues. So in the back of my mind, I always thought, I want to be back in New York City. I want to be back in New York City. I want to be TV and film. I want to do this. So I think if you have something, a goal and a dream that you aspire to do, no matter how much you work on where you are at that particular moment, I just couldn't, I couldn't, it just didn't click. Hmm. So that's when I felt like I was standing in place and not really making any sort of, I made strides, you know, I made, I made it work for myself. I was terrified every time to go on stage, terrified. Can you imagine being afraid most of your career, 10 years, afraid to go on stage because you didn't want to make a mistake. And if you made a mistake, you can't catch yourself because it's not your language. If I make a mistake in, in, uh, um, Wonderful world, wonderful right? Wonderful world. You know, I may well be like, um, you know, there was one po point where there was no tie. Yes, up. I remember that. Uh, uh, yes. And I just kept opening each door, drawer, and I'm like, where? okay, well, it's not here. It's not it, right. You know. Yeah. How would I have done that um, in Germany? I don't, in, in a German musical? I don't know. Um, no, absolutely. So. And in fact, it, I remember that performance when, when the tie wasn't there. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> Where is the, the oh? But you know, ninety nine percent of the audience, except like you know us in the creative team, like nobody knew. Like, nobody knew. They said like, oh, like that's a funny little moment that they wrote into it. Yeah. Because you made it a funny little. Yeah, moment. In, in playing off you saw because one point with the tie, one time the tie was too tight. Yeah. And he literally was like, I was like, sorry about you know, we we just we fed off of one another, which was it's it's, it's amazing working with him, yeah. everyone actually. So. Oh no, this really is an, an outstanding cast and we have the show in hibernation. Now, I don't know if any of those here uh, uh, in, the, in, in the class today, the Athenis was able to see uh, Lana perform, but if you were, just, uh, just let us know. Very few people were able to see it before we were forced to go into hibernation, but the show will be back. As I, I say at every single one of these classes, we do the first thing that will happen at the Colony Theater as soon as we are allowed to open. I'm writing that as Lana wrote, uh, I am Bell McKelly on Broadway. <laughs> Next thing that will happen at the Colony Theater as soon as we're able to, to, to open is A Wonderful World. The stage is still there. The set is there intact. 
everyone's dressing room is intact, all the wigs are in place, all the mics are in place. The moment we're all allowed to go back, we just wake from hibernation and, and continue with the show. And I'm so um, grateful to hear that, you know, it's just so nice to know that, you know, that it's not done, it's not over, this show is not over. It is, uh, there's so much exploration. And, and so David Charlin, who is saying he's our, he's our board chair, board chair of Miami Drums, love her. <laughs> and love her as Lil, oh, well, thank with all you. caps. And David, this is the first time I, I, I see him writing all caps. This has, this ooh, is, ooh. I've never ever seen David uh, writing all caps. Um, and he saw you, listen, I remember how he came, he saw you in the reading in New York that we did more than a year ago. Um, and, and I really, we were all struck by, by, by how, you know, by your performance. So there's more question here, Jay Jones says, as Miami Drama, have you thought about looking into Orlando for actors? A lot of Broadway talent is now from Florida. Yeah, I mean, we, 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 we have our casting calls everywhere. Um, Playbill, Actor Acts, you know, everywhere Equity sends it out, uh, we, we do that. Sometimes um, we get people from Orlando. Sometimes we get people from Minneapolis. I mean, we, we're not just New York. For some shows, we do use casting directors. Uh, but even so, they, they go and, and they look for other places. In a way, it's the same for us to bring somebody from New York or from Orlando uh, because at the other day, it's, it's housing. And, and uh, so we, we are always eager to find people uh, that work for the show uh, wherever we're able to find them. And... Um, and, and definitely Orlando is a hotspot for sure. I mean, the, the, the parts have made it uh, a really exciting community for actors to be. And in fact, the Fringe Festival in Orlando is sort of the largest in, in this uh, neck of the woods. And, um, um, and I guess that's what Orlando has going on for itself, which is that there is uh, an industry that allows actors to live, not just theater. In a way, New York or Atlanta, you know, you get, you, 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 you're in law and order a couple of times and that's sort of like, is the same pay as like doing two shows of Broadway. Um, but we don't have that in Miami. There is not, at, at one point there was, you know, Miami Vice, which by the way, David Charlin, our board chair, appeared in two episodes as an actor. Nice. Um, and yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, other shows, uh, they're being filmed here, but lately uh, there haven't. And that, that also takes a toll we have, you know, great actors for those who saw um, Queen of Basel. We have the lead um, move, move to Atlanta because, you know, opportunities are there. Uh, and, uh, and that is something that Miami needs. We need to get our groove back as, uh, you know, because some, for an, an actor, it's, it's hard to sustain yourself economically only doing theater. And it's important, those complementary industries. Um, Natalie, do you recommend having an agent or relying on open calls to get audition opportunities? Well, I mean, I think if you have, have the goods, you can get your job without one first and then get the agent. So it can go either way. Right. So, yes. I mean, once you get an agent, then life gets somewhat easier. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I personally feel like uh, I'd rather have an agent. Uh, just so you can get into those calls and sing an entire song. Because when you go to those EPAs, you, you know, sometimes they, they run out of time and they come back. And, you know, we have this joke of like, we want one note, you know, 16 bars. So it's, it's tough. So with an agent, definitely uh, much easier, like you said. Yeah. Um, so uh, Anek says, I saw her in Germany and she was the best Velma Kelly I have <laughs> ever seen. Well, you know, people speak the truth. I love it. Absolutely. Thank you for your comment. Thank uh, you for joining, Annika. Thank you. So an anonymous attendee says, I recently wrote a show for my school to do next year. Is it 100% ours and it's very exciting. Do you have any words of wisdom for developing the show to the fullest extent? Sticking to the story while continuing to explore the artistry. Okay, it's a... It's a rough question uh, to, to, to wrap our minds around it. Uh, you know, 
you wrote a show for your school to do next year. It's 100% your, ours, yours. Uh, very exciting. Do you have any words of wisdom for developing that show to the fullest extent? Draw from your own personal experience. Uh, a lot of that should be personal. I mean, obviously, she wrote, it's she, right? Uh, it's, it's anonymous, so. so. She, he, or they, or those, because um, I know it's, uh, I think it's great to draw from personal experience, then it's always uh, much more uh, real and exciting, I guess. It's a really, it's a tough one, it's a tough question. Yeah, and when you're doing a new show, you know, a, you're sort of like, it, it is putting yourself naked in front of the world. And, uh, you know, new shows are, they, they are, you know, we, that's mainly what we do at Miami New Brown. We mainly do new shows and, uh, and you have to be very self-critical about the work you're doing. Uh, and, and you also have to be open. It's interesting because you want to, you want to hear a lot of comments, but not all feedback is helpful feedback. So no. as an artist, you have to, there's a Liz Lerman method of, um, of response to work. And it's sort of a, and I would recommend you to, to, to Google what the Liz Lerman method is, um, because it's a good way of getting feedback, but you in a way are controlling what you want to hear, what questions you want to be answered. Um, and, and I think that that is a, a good mechanism, I would say um to 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 try to deal with that so gavin gregory gavin hi uh, gavin and i have to say again another commercial for someone like what a what an actor what a guy i mean oh my god when he's he, all around uh, the creme de creme. he's a you know an extraordinary actor he uh played king joe oliver uh, on a wonderful world and the uh, and he is just, it's just magnetic to see him perform. He has a couple of great numbers. He's sort of like a larger than life uh, kind of actor. And I just love, like, it's just like, what a nice guy, you know? I mean, he's, yeah. I see him and I see like a big heart and then I see him come in. You know what I mean? Like, that's how I, he always like leads with like that big smile and, and wonderful. I mean, what a guy. As an actor, most of the time, we are not able to create characters from scratch which is what we're talking about. How are you able to live in the shoes of another actor that was created by someone else? And that's, that, that's what 98% of actors have to go through, which is, you know, when, when, you know, when you're, you, somebody else created the character, how do you make it your own? Well, you put your own, it's, it's you. You're a different person from the other person. You may have a different uh, way of, of, of delivering the line that you, we're all, I mean, we're doing the same roles. There's, there's so many Velmas, but there's so many uh, roles, so many different interpretations, how you may um, just interpret the role or the character itself. You bring yourself no matter, uh, no matter what to the role, no matter what. Whether you're Nala or Shenzi and there's 20 people before you, it's always going to be you. So it will always, I mean, we are interpretive artists, right? And we have to interpret something and, and, and the most we can do it our own within the boundaries of what that character is. <laughs> within the boundaries, exactly. Yeah, but, uh, storytelling. But, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great question. And sometimes, you know, there's been a, a play that's been going on for, for, for on and on, for, and then an actor does it and then suddenly it feels like a new part. And that is sort of yeah. kind of, you know, without trying to bring attention to yourself, really, but bring attention to the character in a new light. You no, know, you, you would say, uh, you know, that might be a, an approach. Jason Williams, again, our dear Jason is saying, when performing in a show for so long, how do you find the light or that small amount of energy, energy to keep it fresh? At the same time, audience, how do you audience. find the light when the show that you absolutely love has gone dark? Oh. Yeah, I mean, it's a, what do you think, Lana? Well, I think, Jusan, you're doing a really great job with uh, the music that you're, you're putting together and your enthusiasm with writing new things. Just keep the light within, that's for sure. And as far as doing a show over and over again, 
I remember seeing, sitting in Q&As for Chicago and the great, one of the best things I heard from an answer like that, you know, how do you keep it fresh? The audience, right. it's a new audience. There's right. someone in there that's going through something uh, that you may be a reason that changed their life forever. So that brings a newness to it, a fresh new look. It just, yes, it's the same thing, but it's a different audience. You're a different person every single day. So you can bring that to your work. And as far as going dark, we're gonna be, we're gonna be at it again soon yeah. enough. And, and you have here your producer telling you just um, <laughs> yes. that, that the Colony Theater, once we're gonna go, and we are going, I mean, this, whatever long this, Pause. Whatever. Listen, we are now in Passover for, for uh, you know, and the Jews were for 40 years in the desert and we're not going to be 40 years waiting uh, to get to our promised land. We're going to be, you know, it's going to be a long month. It might be a year. It might be more. It might be less. Nobody knows. It's not in our hands. But whenever it is, we're going to be right back where we left. Only we're going to be wiser. We're going to be more thankful because we know the frailty of what it is that we're doing. Um, and, uh, and now, you know, part of our commitment is that we're going to do a longer run because now we know that the show kicks ass. We're going to do a longer run uh, uh, because it's, it's amazing and it's, it's going to give. Now we have, you know, you know, video and pictures to really bring attention to the show early on, to advertise early on, to bring the people around the country that we need to bring to see it. So, um, but about the question of what an actor, you know, th th there's a great book. Mike Alfred wrote this book called Different Every Night, Freeing the Actor. Uh, and it's sort of about, you know, the improvisation techniques uh, that sometimes companies, you know, one of the chapters there is sort of about the companies that, uh, that you know, the, the Agatha Christie show, uh, they've been doing it for 40 years or whatever. <laughs> they do this silly exercise, like there's like a penny and everybody in the cast needs to hold that penny at one moment in the show. So everybody, all the oh! actors are like thinking about like, oh my God, how am I going to give this, you know, <laughs> this, so, you know, in a way of, of adding, adding another layer to, 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 to bring the danger back into the show, the show needs to, oh, you know, every show, that you're doing needs to feel dangerous, right? Like the moment a, a show feels safe, it's sort of like a museum piece, but you need to and really- And then you make mistakes. When it gets too safe, then you make mistakes. You make mistakes, that's right, that's mm -hmm. right. Um, I was say, like uh, a tie not being there, but that was a whole different <laughs> reason behind yeah. it. You know, I realized that, uh, that there's a word, word war in wardrobe. Uh, I didn't- uh, uh, <laughs> Until, yes. until recently, there's a war. Yeah, it's, war. It's, it's one of my favorite scenes because I love yeah. action with, I just love it, but it, it, it kept me definitely on my toes because it was always something new right. yeah. in front of people. You know, when you're doing new things in front of people and all of a sudden it's not what it's supposed to be, it's, it's, a, it's another element of like, ooh, ha so, um, Anya Sanders, is, is it possible to schedule a meet and greet once the show starts back up? Yes. So we do uh, a lot of, of talkbacks. We do a lot of talkbacks after show. Actors always leave through the lobby and people stay there. And, and you know, I mean, I would say they can hug them, but under Corona, <laughs> they'll probably ask you to, to, you know, I don't know, hopefully by then that's not going to be a problem. But yes, like we are, you know, these comments are very open. We have a lot of Q&A, talkbacks, et cetera. So there'll be ample opportunities. Are you guys inviting schools? So Miami New Drama is extremely committed to education. So we, we do a variety of things. Um, we bring in a total number of about 8,000 public high school students to see our shows during the year. Uh, and we pay for their buses. We pay, pay for their tickets. We pay for everything. The school has absolutely no expense. You know, we offer it to every single school, whoever wants to sign up, we help coordinate get their bosses, we pay for their bosses and we bring them in. Um, and it's exciting. I think we were scheduled to do four or five student matinee performances for A Wonderful World. Hopefully we'll be able to, to schedule that again. We also at Miami New Drama create a touring company. Last year we did a, a, a production of Antigone, this year of Caucasian Chuck Circle by Bertolt Brecht. And we 
go for a whole month. We do 30 performance in different middle schools and public high oh, schools beautiful. of Miami-Dade County. Um, and, uh, and then again, that's another about 8,000 or 7,000 kids that get to see our work that way. So in a year, 15,000 uh, public high school students from Miami-Dade County see the work of Miami New Drama. And that is sort of, you know, we started uh, as a very small program and through the years we've been growing it. Um, and we're now even more aggressively going to continue um, growing that. We have for the first time a director of education and are, you know, continue to, uh, uh, to change, uh, you know, continue, continue with that. Is my new drama looking for teens? Uh, oh. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question. We are, uh, as our, education program expands we will have opportunity for teens to be you know uh, prepared uh, you know to be educated uh some of our shows require teens uh and sometimes we have a hard time finding them we're, we're doing our town uh, there's a couple of roles that, that it took a while until we were able to find them um so yeah i mean depending on on, on what show we do we will try to you know find those people lana have you mentored other artists? Oh, what a great question from Jade Jones. Have you mentored other artists? Oh, gosh. You, as far as like, uh, no, just more or less. Uh, I mean, I would love to do that. That would be definitely something I would love to do, but I've never done that. Well, what a great opportunity it is now to find a mentee. Um, yes, I would and, definitely, uh, I would be so into that. I've never done it before. Um, people have asked, um, but I've never, no, I've never done that. So we had uh, a question and it just sort of disappeared, but from the great Nicole Henry, we were just singing your praises, Nicole, um, uh, which is somebody we need to get into the master classes. And what, I mean, that's another person that I just, I mean, I can't believe she exists. I can't believe that, that, uh, I mean, she's so talented, so magnetic, so godly. I mean, I... I she really is. Well, well, she's I mean, a goddess. She, she is absolutely is a goddess. It's just, I love watching Lana work. Such a professional, super prepared, focused, and yes, such a supportive and inspired energy. Bravo. I love Nicole. Nicole, by the way, I've seen your... I'm a, fa I'm a fan of your... Um, your she, stories. Yeah. yeah, her, yeah, yeah. She, she does her balcony concerts. Um, and, uh, and with the birds, balcony, balcony concerts with the birds. Right. <laughs> um, and, and, and yes, I mean, that's somebody that we have to schedule uh, a masterclass with. And yes, you I, do. Oh my God. What a, what a, an extraordinary performer and artist. Uh, and she's a part of our community. She's like, she makes us proud of Miami, you know, and that yeah. is, uh, you know, that is something, you know, that means a lot, I think, for us. Um, you know, for us to see her succeed. Um, Anonymous says, Lana, so great that when she was performing with Brandy on Broadway, Brandy told her she was a mentor to her. The oh, other okay. person, she said that about was Whitney Houston. Yes, I remember she said that. She, I actually have that on tape. She, where she said that. I, That's I'll a never... nice clip to have. <laughs> I know, right? She was, uh, or is, uh, not only, what I loved about her journey as Roxy is people would always say to her, you know, which then I, I actually start, I kept for myself, but they would always say, Brandy, Brandy, have a great show, have a great show. And her, her response to that was never, thank you. She would say, it's already done. <laughs> and I love that because if we can pre-pave our show already, right? Like I, I, I would say that right before I'm, I'm in the box for you know coming up for Velma Kelly, and I would say to myself, I am so so grateful for this amazing performance that I had had. Uh, so Anya Sanders says that she's been one of those students over five times, so she's seen. Anya has seen our work either by tour or that's amazing. Anya, do you mind writing down what shows you've seen? I'm so excited uh, that you're here uh, and I hope, you know, we continue to serve you and you can continue really to grow uh, 
with us because there's nothing that excites us more than that. Um, Armand Munoz says, I'd like to volunteer to be Lana's first mentee. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay, you heard it here, folks. You heard it here. Um, and then Nicole, mwah. thank you, Nicole. Uh, Annex says, can you make sure to let the show long run enough so I long run enough so I can get book a flight from Amsterdam, Holland to come to see it? I am her biggest fan and don't want to miss the show in Miami. Lana is the most beautiful, and loving person I've ever met. We have a lot of things in common, um, Annex and. Um, uh, we we will hopefully run it for as long, but 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 rest assured, this show will not stop in Miami. Uh, it, the show has legs, it has heart, uh, and um, uh, and but yes, there's no place like Miami to see it, uh, and especially there's no place like Lincoln Road to see a show. Uh, so much better than Times Square. It's a great uh, theater. <laughs> it's a great theater. It's a great place to work. Um, yeah. If anybody gets an opportunity to work there, it's, it's really. A great opportunity. It's, it's a nice place to, uh, it's a nice little home. So how do you, you know, how do you prepare for an, an audition? What is the process for you uh, to prepare for an audition? Well, A, I have to learn the material. I try to be as off book as I can possibly have. Um, try to, uh, well, uh, study the character, you know, do all the work that needs to be done to search who this person is, why this person is in the scene. Um, I prepare that way um, and definitely uh, get the rest. Uh, just keep, keep working at uh, preparing myself the best way I can and go in there without any expectations. Hmm. And uh, also going into the room without a desperation. Hmm. Um, you don't want to be desperate because that shows. Just that be, shows, doesn't it? Right? Just be yourself. Just go in there and just say hi and light up the room, heat it up. Right. I mean, and it's interesting because I've been I've been on on that side of the of the table, and uh, and it, it's. I hate, I really hate audition. I hate it. I hate it. I think it's an extremely unfair. Um, I mean, I'd much rather see an actor work and say like, I want that person in my show. Uh, but, but auditions are, it's hard because the power resides on one side and, and, you know, you get to see a ton of really prepared people and, um, and, uh, it's, I mean, I don't know. I think, it's, but, but the moment you see an actor there that actually is able to shift the power balance of the room, because the room starts with a with a power bar. Like there's a table, there's a people behind the table. Who and never really a... speak on the other side. Never. They never really, they just literally you come in and it's the most uncomfortable, not all thing, not all auditions, but you come in and they're just sitting there and you go hi and they're all like, hello. Absolutely. I mean, it can be a little intimidating. But if I, you listen. go in there and change the temperature of the room, Yes. This is your, it's your performance. You're performing. Go in there and turn on the floodgates. <laughs> but there's, so, there, right, there's certain people that they come into a room and they shift the energy. They shift the power structure of the room. And suddenly you feel like, oh, they're the powerful one and not us in there. And, and, and this, I don't know how that happens, but, but, but you know when you've experienced when somebody comes in and in a way, I guess the trick is not recognizing that, you, that the person on the other side of the table has any power. And I right. think that that is, I think, the most successful way to approach it. So Anya Sanders says, I've seen Our Town Fake, The Bridge of San Luis Rey, Viva La Parranda, and a few other, oh my God, and a few in school productions. Oh, that's awesome, Anya. So happy to hear Viana, our director of education, is going to be really happy uh, to, to hear this response. This is... Uh, you know, we love, especially the our, our Town was our first time we did a, uh, a student production um, for 400 kids. And it was very, it was very special. And David Charlin, our board chair, was there with me. Uh, we were sitting sort of all the way in the back. Um, and, it, you know, it's that, that, that wonderful scene in which Emily and George are about to get married. Um, they both sort of like freak out at the same time. And it's sort of the brilliance of Thornton Wilder that he wrote 
sort of like the marriage scene a bit before the actual marriage. And what needs to happen is um, Mr. Webb says like, all right, Emily, you love him. All right, George, you love him. Now, you know, stop the nonsense, get married. Um, and, and what happened was that the audience was, you know, the kids were responding so much to it. Unlike any, any show we've ever done before, every beat was working. You know, the, the nervousness of George and Emily, the hormones, like the kids were picking up that in the way that the adults were not. And then <laughs> it was just so powerful and so beautiful that in the wedding, it was so charged. Um, and uh, Luigi Shaman, who's a spectacular actor from Venezuela, he was playing the, the and by the way, our production, for those of you who don't know, it, it, it's the first uh, trilingual production ever allowed of our town. One family spoke Spanish at home, the Webbs, the Gibbs spoke a mix of Haitian Creole and English at home, and then the rest of the town spoke English. So there were three languages at all time during the show, um, and Luigi, uh, you know, he, you know, he, he needed to go there and say like, all right, like, you know, you love her, you know, will you love her yet? So they, you know, he, in a way he marries them before the actual ceremony, but he got so moved by the students that he started to cry and he couldn't <clears throat> stop crying. And then the actors playing Emily and George were like, no, 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 don't worry. We're going to get married. No problem. You know, don't cry. <laughs> so, Real. So that was, yeah. that, and at that moment we realized that there was something magical that was happening with students. And then that is our mission from now on. It was like, well, we have to bring this opportunity for students, period. And we raised the money to do it. And that is, you know, for me, you know, it became sort of like part of the, the, the larger mission of why we do what we do. Uh, Annette says, um, what's the difference between preparing for an audition in Europe and in the States? What a great question. Well, uh, the language is one. <laughs> um, it's just a different pool. I, I, like I said earlier uh, before, it's just, um, it, when I was in Germany, um, there was maybe about 10 black women. Hmm. Um, so you can imagine the pool of competition. And in New York City or LA, well, you do the math. There's a lot more people. So I think that the, 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 the pool is, is a fiercer, uh, more intensity. There's more intensity in America than it is over overseas because it's just a, it's a smaller pool over there. But were the, the audition rooms the same? Was it, you, you, you know, did you find uh, any difference between, between, between that? Well, you have more audition rooms, obviously, in New York City. Um, um, were the you, casting directors, the directors, were they as cold, as distant in German, Germany? Um, I would say that in Germany, well, I've gone for, to sister, I did sister act in German um, as Dolores Van Cartier. And actually, they're, I wouldn't say a lot nicer, but they're more uh, re reactive in the in mm -hmm. room. Um, they, they work with you a little bit differently, but it, it's different because then you get into a certain situation in, in New York City where they know you they, and they work with you. So I, I, I don't think it really, there's that much of a difference between the two, just as far as the amount of people compared to the States. Um, well, I mean, it's, uh, you know, that definitely, you know, at least working in Venezuela for, for a decade or so before I, I moved, um, and directing there, I, I think that there's definitely um, a, um, uh, you know, when, when I went to, you know, New York, and it's funny because there's, there's so many, ca so this, so I went to grad school in, in New York, uh, and the first thing we do, uh, uh, you, you have to cast a, a list of act, you know, a group of actors so you can work with them throughout the year. And so this is actors only performing for a class of six people and well, two professors who, you know, were sort of, Anne Bogart and, and, and Brian Kulik who were sort of, you know, important New York people, but um, there were 500 people auditioning to be used as actors in classrooms. And I, that blew my mind. And there were so many talented people auditioning for things this big. Uh, and because there's so many people, I understand now sort of 
they sing in New York, like, okay, next, 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 next. There's a, there's a divorce in, you know, you, I mean, you humanizing the actor uh, because there's so many talented people that it just sort of becomes a, you know, sort of like doing revolving door, mm-hmm. revolving door. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and that is, um, you know, that is something that, that it was hard for me to understand that sort of like coldness of a casting room. Um, uh, there is, uh, I'm going to write down here, education at miaminewdrama.org um, is, uh, if anybody wants to be in contact with Viana Rodriguez, the director of uh, education, um, this is the way to do it. Uh, I, I wrote it down in the chat um, and I'm going to write her name. Uh, you know, uh, she's a director of education. Feel free to reach out to her. There's op- opportunities, absolutely. Uh, you know, backstage uh, internships, etc. So, so make sure that you write to her. Uh, Brian uh, says, "I saw this production. I came from New York to see Jason and Miss Gordon and Jason's chemistry. Is something to watch." Who oh, thank York. you. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean that. That scene between uh, between the two of you, that whole chapter, it's so dynamic. So it's it, it's the first time uh, that Louis Armstrong finds his match, right? Somebody who is, if not more talented than him, and and, uh, and seeing that uh, that bickering duo, bickering couple, <laughs> right? Um, exactly. It's, uh, it's just really really impressive. Um, well, we have, you know, time for a few final questions. Uh, Lana, do you have any other thoughts to share with us? Um, uh, you know, especially uh, advice to, to, to young, um, you know, to, to young aspiring actors? Well, I just know one thing that my aunt um, said to me years ago uh, when I was overseas and really struggling with it. She said, you know, there's so many roads to take. Eventually you'll get to the road you're supposed to be. You'll get, you'll eventually get there. It's just, you will take a longer road. So I feel like my 10 years was a longer road. Cause I definitely had those moments of like, what if I stayed in New York city? Where would I be? But that just makes me frustrated. So I try not to think like that. I was supposed to take that journey. Right. No matter what journey you take, allow yourself to go on that journey because you will come out right where you're supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, have a positive outlook on life. Don't take anything personal. Mm-hmm. Um, don't beat yourself up when you go into the room and you don't get the job or you don't do a good job. I mean, I've had many auditions where I've gone in and and I wasn't as prepared as I thought I was. And I messed it up. Sometimes those are the jobs that you book. Um, so don't, don't be so hard on yourself. Be hard in a way of making yourself work towards your goal and get better. But don't be hard on yourself. Don't be hard on yourself, but keep working. Keep working and believing in yourself and the journey. I mean, I think that metaphor where you said of the journey is so true. You know, you're always moving forward. Sometimes the journey takes a detour that you weren't expected. Um, but I think you you learn from those from those detours and you know your experience in Germany having to develop because you couldn't develop so much. Maybe that's it because you couldn't develop so much the lingual. You know, the 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 spoken part of being an actor because you had a limitation to it because that wasn't your first language, et cetera. Maybe you developed something else. And maybe as I was describing you before we start, I referred to that quality of you, um, not realizing that there might be a connection, that there is something magnetic when you come in. And I think that might have been uh, the development of having, you know, having to, to develop other skills of, of an actor <laughs> when, when language was had had in a way a ceiling you 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 know you were able to communicate using your angel your charm and that's very evident when 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 we see your work 
Um, so I thank you. You know, I wait for the day eagerly uh, for you to return. Me as too. Hardy, because Me you're too. Us in a row, and the show is outstanding. There's a couple more questions. Anya says, I just want to say thank you so much for giving us your time and dropping these wonderful gems. Thank you. Thank you, Lana, uh, says Anya. Uh, Brian says, I just want to say this. I'm a part of the song's choir, JW's inspiration singer, and he's absolutely the best. He is absolutely, I agree with that. This is his time. Blessing to everyone. I mean, this is absolutely just on. Carries this show. Uh, and, and I said before, this show needed a star, and Jason is is able to do uh, that extremely hard role of doing homage to a person we all know and close our eyes and can think about it, but creating something that is your, his own. Um, and Nicole Henry, wow, thank you, great time. You know, it just puts a smile on my face. And, uh, I'm, and I'm so grateful that everybody would take time out of their um, day yeah. to, to listen to what I had to say. And uh, I appreciate it because um, we all have to continue to inspire one another and lift each other up and reset ourselves in this time, in this, this we're, what we're going through. There's a final question from Cecile Stranson. Is there a role that you would like to have the opportunity to redefine? or give it a contemporary twist? Is there any role in the, you know? Well, I've been told many times that I'd make a great Fanny Bryce, so let's see if that will happen. Let's see if that will happen. <laughs> Meanwhile, yeah. Meanwhile, Lil Harden is still Lil something Harden very is on, uh, on Miami New Drama on Lincoln Road as soon as uh, this. We are lifted. And soon, yes. Yeah. All right, Lana, thank you so much for your time. You were amazing. You. Oh, and, so uh, are you. Look, you make it much easier. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> what am I going to say? You know, but thank you. I look forward to seeing you in person very soon, giving you a proper hug. But until yes. then, stay safe, everyone. Stay safe. We're going to email you all the video of this. Uh, and uh, any questions, please ask Jessica. Uh, Jessica will also share her email. And please follow me on Instagram, and I'll follow you right back. Right. So, what can you write in your in the chat here? What is your Instagram oh, uh, let's see. Uh, handle? Lana Jean Warden, and I will follow you right back. Promise. All right. Thank you all so much. Have a lovely and uh, safe time. So we have a ton of new um, master classes coming up next week. Uh, we're also starting uh, the masterclass series in Spanish. So we are also going to have uh, leaders of the theater field in Latin America and in the Hispanic US share with us their experience. All of that information at colony.org. Uh, and uh, I'm excited uh, for you to see what we have ahead. We have uh, workshops that are smaller, for a limited amount of people to really work out on skills. We have larger ones um, as well. And, and we have really exciting people ahead. Go to colony.org for detail. And thank you so, so much. And I'll see you all very soon. And Lana, I really hope it's very soon that we, we And get thank you, see. Michelle, for always making um, uncomfortable situations so comfortable. <laughs> I think really? you, see, you see some you see things in people that they normally don't see so we're i'm grateful for you thank you You're too kind thank you so much Lana. thank you everyone and we'll see you thank all you. very soon bye, bye.